Hey there, my friends. How are you doing? Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Hope all is well. Yeah, we hope everything is going well. And uh, I think Jill is looking forward to what we're going to do over these next few hours. Tell me what you think and how do you feel about what we're doing. Uh, uh, I'm looking forward to talking about it and I'm ready to start. Father, we thank you for this time. Bless this time. Let your will be done. And we thank you, Lord, that Jill is ready to get started. And so am I in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So do well. I hope you have a blessed weekend. So here we go. So the name of this message is, the title of this message is, The Blessing of a Church Without Walls. So I want you to hear, I want you to, if you got a pencil, or you don't have a pencil, or something to write with a piece of paper, um, I hope you go grab it. Because this is this is this is this is our what we call it now homeschool virtual classroom. So the same principles at times that apply to these kids are going to apply to us when it comes to being students, disciples of Christ, um, and and desiring to grow. Yeah. So I'm going to start with Ezekiel 13. Now this is called uh, the blessing. Of a church with our walls. And when we speak on my way downstairs today, I, I, I put a note to myself and it says this, you know, you need to know about the walls in your life and the walls in other people's lives. You need to know where they are. Um, When I asked myself why, why, why would something like this be important to me? And I realized, I, I said to myself, I need to know who will crack under pressure. I need to know if I'm going to crack under pressure. And that's what, sort of what this lesson is about. So I'm going to start reading from Ezekiel chapter 13. Starting about verse 10. I'm reading Amplified. It says, even because... They have seduced my people, saying peace when there is no peace. And because when one builds a flimsy wall, behold, these prophets dab it over with whitewash. Why was that pretty important to me also? It's because sometimes when you're leading people, they want you to dab it. We want you to dab their wall. And as a speaker, this, 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 this was a prophet. These prophets were receiving a rebuke because they would see that the wall is flimsy, but they would cover over it with whitewash. Verse 11 says, say to them who dab it with whitewash that it's your fault. There should be a downpour of rain and you, O oh great hailstones, shall fall and a violent wind shall tear down, tear apart the whitewashed flimsy wall. So what you're saying is that there were breaks and cracks and major cracks or things in the wall that could be, that needed to be repaired. And they took uh, a cheap plaster type uh, material or something, dabbed it, meaning to dab means just to They made it look right. Patched. They mm -hmm. patched it up, but mm -hmm. they didn't Repair the breaks. Absolutely. You made it look right, but you didn't go in and help help you didn't go in and help people understand the, 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 the importance of structure in their life, structure when it comes to the kingdom of God. Say to them who dab it with whitewash that it shall fall. There shall be a downpour of rain, and you, O great hailstone, shall fall, and a violent wind shall tear apart the whitewash flimsy wall. Behold, when the wall is falling, will you not be asked? Where is the coding with which you prophets dab? See, this blesses me because because Dave Thompson used to say all this, say this all the time. Oh, it pays where you go to church. Now I want to say it this way: It matters. He didn't say it pays. He said it matters. It matters what you feed on. That's what we talked about last week. She said, "Feed on me." It matters. It matters that, 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 that someone believes and understands that the wall will fall. 
the wall will fall. And that's what I said earlier. Uh, uh, just, why, why do you need to know that? Maybe, maybe, maybe you are a fiance or maybe you are a woman <clears throat> looking for companionship or a man looking for companionship. You need to know whether this wall is going to crack under pressure as much as you possibly can. You, you, you need to know uh, uh, what, what, whether it's stable or not. Why? Because when that way hailstone comes, and that's what it says, it says, uh, verse 13, therefore thus says the Lord God, I will even rend it with a stormy wind in my wrath, and there should be an overwhelming rain in my anger and great hailstones to destroy that wall. Here's, here's what I want you to hear. So will I break down the wall that you have dabbed with whitewash and bring it down to the ground so that its foundations will be exposed. That contain, continues to be very important to me because it, it is what allows me to go through doors that sometimes I don't want to go through. To face challenges and stay in, in a faith mindset a reality mindset, <clears throat> even though the cat, even though I know it's going to be a bit challenging, painful, uh, uncomfortable. Because this is what I do know. I know that this pressure and certain things in my life is going to expose something that I don't see. And I want to know if there are cracks in my foundation. I want to be able to make it through the rain. I want to be able to make it through the storm. I want to believe when it's hard to believe. I want a firm foundation. And that's what this is about. Can I say something? Mm -hmm. The reason I chose this um, screenshot behind us was that when I looked at it, many of us, we see storms, but we also don't see the presence of God as a cleansing wash a cleansing waterfall and part of the fall takes place when what you thought was one thing he will send you a fresh batch of spirit water truth you name it and it will be very powerful but you have to learn how to receive that right and, and, and in, in the next statement here when it says so will i break down the wall that you have dabbed with whitewash and bring it down to the ground so that its foundations will be exposed. When it falls, you will perish and be consumed in the midst of it. See, when that wall, whatever that wall of protection, let's talk about that. Uh, defensiveness, which is some kind of wall. Um, we're gonna talk about a bit of wishful thinking, which is some kind of wall. But whatever, whatever those walls are denying, whatever those walls are, this is what it's saying about life. I want you to hear this to be about life. When it falls down, it's going to consume you. Your faulty faith, that's why there's such thing as shipwrecked faith. When it falls, it's going to consume you. But, 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 but the thing that sometimes Ron, keeps us where we are is that the wind. You know, we, we think the win, W-H-E-N, is that something's going to happen right away. When oftentimes, it's just the opposite because it takes a long time before, you know, if you have a home, it takes a long time before the crack in the foundation reaches the rest of the house and then the house fall in. That's a slow process, but it is a win. Not if, but when. And so when you live like these walls that you may have are a matter of when and not if, then, we, then you may take more seriously not, not responding, resisting, fighting back, trying not to go into a new space and trying not to leave an old space. So it says, when it falls, you will perish and be consumed in the midst of it. And you will know and understand and realize that I am the Lord. Thus I will accomplish my wrath upon the wall and upon those who have dabbed it with whitewash. And I will say to you, this wall is no more. Neither are they who dabbed it. 
the false prophets of Israel who prophesied deceitfully about Jerusalem, seeing visions of peace for her when there is no peace, says the Lord. These scriptures right here, they keep me because over the years, you want folks to want, and, and some still want, you want me to say peace, but there is no peace. You want me to dab, and I won't dab, and I won't dab either. There were moments on this journey of ministry where I was doing the work. I felt the spirit was leading me to do production plays, all these different things. And it was a point where I was now saying things that were not common being said inside the church or to church people. And what I was attempting to do, so I see now, is that I, I was choosing not to say things that are going to make people feel good but to speak truth. And in speaking truth, it really damaged uh, some people's walls because they were not prepared for what was being said. Listen, your children may not know that when you tell them to come in the house at a certain time or you encourage them not to hang in certain circles, they may not know that uh, that wall is going to fall. They may not know what it's going to expose. They may not know that they were going to perish and be consumed in the midst of it, but you know. You know, and you are supposed to stick with what you know. Why is that? Because you have more experience than they do. And I'm not talking about forcing them. I'm talking about what you, what you say and how you stay and where you stay. But verse 17, I'm going to go back to the paper, to the, to the lesson. It says, and you, son of man, Set your face against the daughters of your people who prophesy out of the wishful thinking of their own minds and hearts. Prophesy against them. See, there are times when I've, I've faced people who, who or been in the space of people, and clearly, clearly, their thinking was not in the space of God. It was wishful thinking. They wished the situation wasn't happening. And, and talk strongly about a situation that was happening. But wishful thinking is that these people are coming out of their heart. And what did he say to, 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 the, to God, say to his mouthpiece? Let me tell you who the prophets were. The prophets are, are those who kept the will of God, the will of God in front of the people. They weren't like the priests who could talk. There go, they, they, they stayed in the will of God. I used to say that you're not a, this is not a youth explosion where you all are getting up here saying the same things every time you gather the young people together, but you are not living what you say that you believe. And so there's no power in what you're saying to really bring about uh, change in terms of what you're preaching or what you're teaching. And this is why we as a church are not being affected at all with these generations. Right. When we talk about wishful thinking, that right there, you're talking about dabbing, you're talking about, okay, what, what are we going to do when it comes to a flimsy wall? We know that they, they, that, that is not going to hold them up if that's what we're doing. So I had a couple of notes here. And one is, when it comes to walls, what, what are you holding back behind that wall? So, so let, let me say this first. The it says this, the daughter of your people who prophesy out of the wishful thinking of their own minds and hearts. What is wishful thinking? It's an argument whose premise expresses a desire for the conclusion to be true. They want what they think to be true. They want the way they see it to be true. I have wanted the way I, I saw something to be true. It's been a long time because mostly I have learned through experience that it is worth going through the door. It is worth standing in their life for me. I've, 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 I've had enough um, flimsy wall catastrophes in my life where I had to come back from my own wishful thinking because uh, 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 thinking that came out of fear, not faith. See, thinking that comes out of faith allows me um, to embrace a reality that, that I really don't like. 
and to live as if God was present, even in that reality that at this point I don't like, and most of all, I don't know. What else does, what is, what, what is wishful thinking? What is the benefit of that to people? What is the benefit? Waiting, not having to wait, being able to see a future that you don't understand, that you don't know about, that you don't have the conclusions on, on, but coming up with a conclusion and filling in those empty spaces. Because it allows you to be happy in a season where you should be observant. Very good. Yeah. Absolutely. And what I'm observing mean, mean, meaning you observing in the standing in the disposition of faith. But knowing that all you can do at this point is be a student. You're not leading this one. You don't know where it's going. And we'll talk about that in a minute. So we talked about last week when we said Ecclesiastes 7 said this. Do not say Ecclesiastes 7.10. Do not say why were the old days better than these? For it is not wise or because of wisdom that you ask this. Why would this person say, why, do, do not say that? Well, ask yourself, when you're talking to somebody, just make it really real. I'm talking to Deron, and why don't I say to you and ask you this question, why are the old days better than these? See, that, that, that follows a thought. And what thought does that follow? I'm going to have to face a future or something in front of me that doesn't look the way I want it to look. So rather than deal with the challenge in front of me and put that on the table, I'm going to use this, 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 this statement. And I put here for me, um, it's an excuse not to face the future. It's an excuse not to face the future. See, I'm still talking about flimsy walls. I'm still talking about the walls that, listen, that you don't want somebody to tell you what you want to hear. You don't want that. I think that when I look at the picture that's beside us, a lot of times we don't want, we don't understand for me, for if that scripture says, why were the old days? better the these the mm -hmm. days are like this rushing water news happening mm -hmm. and if you're asking me if you said what if i asked you that that's like me trying to go back to this uh, rush of water mm -hmm. and find the past mm -hmm. that's been flushed out mm -hmm. it's over mm -hmm. it's now time for the new mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we're going to talk about that too. So next scripture I'm going to read is Proverbs 8, 2021. So I'm setting something up here. It says, we had it last 18. week, 18, verse 20 through 21. Proverbs 18, verse 20 through 21. A man's moral self shall be filled with the fruit of his mouth. And with the consequence of his word, he must be satisfied whether good or bad. We reap, we, we're even going to reap the consequence of our words. This is why that wishful thinking, you have to be careful because it, it'll, 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 it'll help you. You'll create an off rack right? And it sounds good. And, and, and I think what I said last week on Wednesday about confirmation bias, which is very similar to wishful thinking, after a while, you'll just go find people who want to agree. Because your goal now is to look for confirmation of the error. And you can find that if you ask the question just right. Or if you tell the story a certain way, you can find that. So it says, a man's moral self should be filled with the fruit of his mouth and with the consequence of his words, he must be satisfied whether good or bad. Death and life are in the power of the tongue and they who indulge in it shall eat the fruit of it for, the, for, for death or life. Why? Why, why is it important for you to see the um, deal with the flimsy walls? Why does the wall need to come down? What we read was the fact, so that something could be exposed. Why is that? Because we speak from what we believe. 
And as long, our beliefs have to be exposed. Whether, whether we really truly believe or not, the, the story of Abraham saying that he loved God and he followed God and he served God. Well, guess what? He had to be tested with that very promise that God gave. Now, to me, what allowed Abraham to go and do it is because he gets to see, he wasn't taking Ishmael, he was taking Isaac. He was taking the child of promise when he and Sarah. So at, at some point, he was not going without God having already fulfilled the promise. But the bottom line still is, even in that, he had to be tested on. Why? Because his belief had to be exposed. Not to God, but to him too. So this is why this pressure is some of these things to, for me, when it happens, I can have a certain attitude about it because I, at this point, I am ready to cooperate with the universe and align myself with the reality that's beyond my wishful thinking, non-reality. When we said, behold, I, he said, I do a new thing. We have been dealing with this for a few months now, and that new thing is he's doing something that you have not seen, you've never experienced, and you have to be prepared to embrace this newness of what is happening. Absolutely, but guess what new things are? Challenging. Right. They're very challenging. So I'm, we're going to read Hebrews 11, 8 and 10, and this is, this is where I think this sums up some things for me. Verse 8, Hebrews 11. It says this, urged on, I'm reading Amplified, urged on by faith, Abraham, when he was called, obeyed and went forth to a place which he was destined to receive as an inheritance. And he went, although he did not know or trouble his mind about where he was to go. What do I want you? Urged on by faith, not wishful thinking. These walls had to come down. Urge on my faith. If not, you're going to urge yourself. Listen, the mind is a powerful thing. And you said enough times, you believe it. But urge on my faith, not, not by wishful thinking. And if he says urge on by faith, what he's saying is that there is a faith in the, once we know faith is what we believe, the substance of what we believe in, but and evidence, but we don't see it. But he had to believe in what he saw in his heart. Even though times were different, he still had to have faith to, to believe into that. Believe in that. Absolutely. And it says, although he did not know or trouble his mind about where he was to go, verse 9, prompted by faith, he dwelt as a temporary resident in the land which was designated in the promise of God. You know, I like that wrong because you all, because sometimes you, you're going through something, it's just temporary. You 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 are you are resident, you 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 you're in a space, but it's a temporary space. You are a resident and you're there and you have to be there, you have to get through that, but it's a temporary resident. But depending on whether you are prompted by faith or fear, see, fear, fear will have you seeing that this is it. I'm stuck right here. Because, why is that? Because you can't predict because you don't know what's in front of you. The whole purpose of faith is that you live, you live trusting and believing in the name. In the name. What, why, why was that important for them? And Deron, you know this from Hebrew, because that name, in, in the first word, meant powerful leader. Okay? It meant one who I don't know if the word was create. It, why Yahweh? Right. So that the first letter, which we in word, was a, a, a bull. And it meant powerful leader. So when they trusted in a name, they already knew that name meant powerful leader. And so with us, this is how we get past that, that, that those thoughts that lead to that 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 are uh, 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 fueled by fear because we believe in that name, and that name is not like Karen and Jill and 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 Clyde and Kirk. No, that name is an action. 
It's a B. Even when, 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 when Moses said, who should I say is sending me? He said, tell him I am. You know what that means? I'm going to be what I need, what, what is needed in that occasion. Let's back it up because I want to be still be a part of this part right here. He said he wanted to, he said he obeyed and went forth to a place he was destined to receive. And so this, this season is supposed that we have to see this, not be afraid of the future, but God is taking me to a place. He is positioning me in the spirit realm, physically or whatever, so that I can receive what it is that he wants me to be able to receive. But I have to tell myself, do not be afraid of the place that he's going to take you to, which he will reveal to you when you're there in that place. But you cannot go into wishful thinking because if you go into wishful thinking, then you change the trajectory of your designated path because you're doing it more so on your emotions, beliefs, than you are on your trust in God and your faith in God. Absolutely. And as you say, uh, 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 this was a place, and then he had to, well, he didn't know this then, but he knows this now. See, we want to know, we want to hear this before that, before we act. We want to hear God say this. I'm going to send you there, but it's only temporary. No. Mm. See, what we're reading right now is what somebody could say after they saw, after the act. After living there for a period of time. But we're trying to be comforted before we even had an opportunity to grow in trust. And to lean and depend on this wall, this rock that is not flimsy. So I'll keep reading. When First we, tip. When we went over the notes and talked about this is about changing the narrative. And you have we have to make a decision not to change the narrative. Meaning wishful thinking. Wishful is. thinking mm -hmm. is changing the narrative. Because when you said competent, oh, I think you said you want to be competent. Well, that means you are confident. Confident. That's your right. You want to change the narrative. But no, this is a part of the, uh, the journey right here. Mm -hmm. This uncertainty. It, it is. And then it, it says, uh, 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 I'm going to read 9 first. Probably by faith, he dwelt as a temporary resident in the land which was designated in the promise of God, though he was like a stranger in a strange land. Living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, fellow heirs with him of the same promise. Verse 10. <clears throat> for he was, and here's the part I like, <clears throat> for he was waiting expectantly and confidently looking forward to the city which has fixed and firm foundations, whose architect and building is God. When, when, when I came to realize that this person, some of some of some of the things that I cared about, well, that was that was tradition, that was culture, that was my neighborhood, that was my shaping. And then I lived and I I, I came into uh, the born again space. And I began to see the difference between that flimsy wall. And then I began to desire and expect and want. And this is what I'm hoping for you. You want that firm foundation. Um, you want that fixed and firm foundation whose architect and builder is God. I, I've had over here so many people talk to me about people pleasing. Um, you know, all of those things come uh, from the part of your, the, 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 the nurture part of your life. Where and, and whoever did it, that 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 architect who was help shaping you and doing those things, doing their best, but that architect wasn't God. So when you allow yourself, and I allow myself to get into this new space, and I allow myself to be challenged, to observe or challenge to to deal with the fact that this wall right here is flimsy, and this thing that I'm trying to stand on. It's flimsy, and its foundation is steady. It's not firm, and it's not fixed. And when you say that you take me to a place that's fixed and firm, 
and it will be it will be the life you plan for me and destined for me to be able to live. And so I see that walking by faith, the place that he's taking me, it's going to be fixed and firm, which means that I, I, I fully trust that when we get to where you're taking me, when we get to where you're taking us, that it will be built by God, not my desires. This, this is what I'm telling you. And you know, when I see this situation in, in, in Magnus Blessed, the blessing of the church without walls, I, I'm, I'm even thinking about not being able to be in the building. Mm -hmm. Because buildings for people have become a flimsy wall. It has become an idol. Buildings for people have become what they were leaning on. Me, me, me. I can't wait to get to church to get to God. Why? 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 Why isn't God present right here? And I'm not saying that 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 we said that from the center of our our being. But what I am saying is, after a while, all of those things become something that distract. Uh, I, I believe in one of the gospels. But Jesus, here he is teaching the disciples, leading the disciples, and they began to tell him to look at this building, how beautiful a building was. And he took them, he took them to the spirit realm, and he said, this building, or, or the, uh, the temple, was going to be destroyed in three days, and then it will be, it will resurrect, or it will be rebuilt. Well, they were talking about a physical building. He, he stayed in his lane, in the reality of why he came. To, to, to change lives from the inside out. And so it's, it's the same with us. It's the same. After, after a while, after a while, who cares whether somebody is whitewashing? Who cares if your wall is flimsy? Who cares? Nobody knows you. You come in, you go out. There's no, no fellowship in the sense of accountability. It's party time. But God is saying this, I'm, I'm telling you that what's happening right now, this ain't the first time. This is not the first time that I exposed the flim that a, a spit flimsy wall was exposed. And it won't be the last. Listen, if that creator loves us the way that I believe we are loved, there's no way. And we're finding out now it's being revealed to us. The church as we know it is no more. The church as we knew it is no more in the sense that we are now being exposed to our limitations of what we put inside of bricks and mortar. Absolutely. The limitations and my experience as a leader in the church has been, wow, now that I am not in the pulpit, I'm not worried about these chairs. I'm not worried about what this person is feeling because when they walked in and they didn't have the seat that they want, I'm not worried about leadership where they are concerned more so about physical things than they are about the spiritual things. I'm not concerned about people's opinions when they're looking at people who got up and paying attention to who left and all that kind of stuff. I am able to focus on the spirit of God. I'm not focused on whether or not this person is now squirming because it's offering time or whether or not this is happening over here. I'm not concerned. I'm not concerned about whether you are vibing with me or not. I have to truly trust that even whatever I'm saying right now is a part of the spirit of God. And then I'm not vibing on, so what do you think about the message or what was going on? Because I am present in the moment. And it's not about just coming up with a checklist of things to do. I'm, I am only concerned about delivering the message of God, period. And so being out of the building, it took, a, it put, it gave me my peace of mind back, my spirit back. You know what I did, Brian? It now makes us focus on God's true house. Right. This is the true house. Right. And that's what I meant when I say that that became a wall of, to, to lean on instead of leaning and depending on God and the true ways of God. We got all of these other things that had to 
that, that, that interfered and all of a sudden um, some other things became important. And I thank all got you God for problem. allowing me to telework and telework from home just like everybody else is working from home. I too get to work from home, work from a place uh, where this is the sanctuary for me. This is our sanctuary and get to work from a place where I'm not trying to please anybody. I'm just trying to do the will of God. And these, so in that one 10 minutes, five minutes, if you listen and observe, you name so many different roles, people pleasing. Right. Um, uh, 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 focus on people, distractions. There's so many walls. That's why I said the blessing um, of a church without walls. Without walls, when our walls come down, we will be dynamic. We will be dynamic. Why? Because walls keep you from cultivating trust. Right. That that it, it, it's safety to you feel safe somewhere, but at the same time, guess what? Behind our walls means we don't need to move into the future. Not the future as we see it, but the future as God sees it, as the Creator sees it, and 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 what we would need to be doing. So I'm going to continue. Can I move on? Yeah. Hebrews 11. We're still in 11. Now I'm reading from verse 13. Listen. It said that these people all died controlled and sustained by their faith. See, I like this because until recently, what sustained us? Each other? Not necessarily our faith in God. It was our faith in each other. And that's good, but God has to stay first. And when God doesn't stay first, when God isn't first, we we can fall out and we can have a misunderstanding and just fall all the way out because God wasn't first. When God not, when God isn't first, you can go on Facebook and talk about people you used to love, who you said you love, who you were connected to. Could have been a husband. Don't care if your children read it someday. But when God is first, we are sustained and controlled. These people were no longer controlled by the traditions, by the culture anymore. This was experience and this was God. Here we go. These people all died controlled and sustained by their faith, but not having received the tangible fulfillment of God's promises only having seen it and greeted from a great distance by faith. And all the while acknowledging and confessing that they were strangers and temporary residents and exiles upon the earth. Verse 14. Now, those people who talk as they did show plainly that they are in search of a fatherland, their own country. 15. If they had been thinking with homesick remembrance of that country or of the past from which they were immigrants, they would have found constant opportunity to return to. Homesick remembrance of that. There's more than one way to look at the past, right? But if you look at the past with homesick remembrance, not faith remembrance, not God thank you for what you've already done, there's a way that your past helps you. Now, we talked about this in spiritual maturity, and I, I used this example from a, um, Skip Mullen, and he was talking about how, how the word for, not word for, the word for future, um, the Hebrew word for future has to do with looking behind. And so, which sounds like the total opposite. But what he said is, imagine yourself as a person in a rowboat. When you're in a rowboat, your back is to the future. And your face is to, so you're backing yourself into a new space. But what's making you give up that effort of rowing that boat, no matter how big the tide is, because you can see you still have your eyes on not where you're leaving, but all that God did for you when you were there. So your faith is to that kind of past, not the homesick, uh, uh, what's his name? Uh, 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 
um, Lot's wife, who kept what her kind of looking back, kept the opportunity uh, open for her to go back. And I'll give you another example of that. So let me read it so we can hear it together. If they had been thinking with homesick remembrance of that country for which they were immigrants, they would have found constant opportunity to return to it. <laughs> Listen, what it's saying is this. When you're looking at your past, the past was better than now, you're going to have opportunities. You're going to create opportunities. You're going to see opportunities because that's what you're looking for. That's the space that you're in. And you say you have ample opportunity to go and return to your past. I have met people that say, why can't I get past this? I feel like I'm stuck. Why, 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 why? Uh, 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 I have such constant unforgiveness. Because of the way you still deal with that past. Because I, mean, I want to teach the bad and do it. But let go. You're not letting stuff go. And that's why you can't get past it. Because you can't let it go. Because at this point, as he said, there is a homesick. There's a familiarity. There's something back there that you think you think you should carry into your future. Anything that's in my past that I'm going to carry into my future, it's already with me. It's in my heart. It's in my heart. If it's not in my heart, then it's in my transformation. Meaning this, it's in my heart because the message of me being transformed from whatever I was to whatever I am, that's still a part of me. Homesick remembrance for me is was interrupted by this current crisis. Well, we all we all mm -hmm. have crises, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but then this current crisis that started for me quite some time ago, literally, it interrupted me because my place of of peace was creativity. My place of peace was being able to flow in the revelation and the spirit of God. My place of peace was being able to follow the thoughts and the meditations of my heart. Mm -hmm. My place of peace, it was interrupted. And so when it got interrupted by this, uh, this season, I had to now make a decision like this waterfall behind me. Well, God, where, who am I? What am I supposed to do now? What is my response? Because I knew it one way, but you're showing me something totally, totally new and different. Help me to be able. And I said, so here's what I long for. I long for the relationship and the connection that you and I had. And once I'm able to regain that, I can regain myself because I could only find my authenticity within you. Absolutely. So <clears throat> listen to the two the contrast of this scripture here. We'll read 15 again. If they had been thinking with homesick remembrance of that country from which they were immigrants, they would have found constant opportunity return to return to it. But the truth is, verse 16, but the truth is that they were yearning for and aspiring to a better and more desirable country. That is a heavenly one. For that reason, God is not ashamed to be their God, even to be surnamed their God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. For he has prepared a city for them. See, when you look back, the, the, all of us have a past. All of us even have a past for a uh, 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 fellowshipping together at one time. But we, we don't have the same eyes. Somebody looks at that past, what back of their past, and they see it half empty. They see this new, this look at their past or this new situation, and they see it as half empty. I don't understand. I don't this. I don't that. I see it as half full. And that is this. God, this is temporary. What I mean by that is you're not finished. I've been here before. I've been in a space where I didn't understand. I've been in a space where I was challenged before. I've been in a space where I was challenged and, and wanted to resist the truth. I've been in a space where I resisted the truth. I've been in a space where I was the wishful thinking person and I just did not want to be in no man's land, so to speak. 
So I began to fill in some spaces with some information. And I began to try to get closure as rather than what you said, Ron, when it was time to observe. For some of us, it is time to observe. Let's get ready to close this out. Here we go. Philippians 3.12 is where we're in. Now, the point that we're talking about this is for this reason. The whole thing about what we just read in Hebrews 11, and it was this. These things are prompted by faith. They're prompted, prompted by the trust that we already have. It's, it's prompted because we've already gained ground in this area. Uh, and, and it said these people were controlled and sustained by that. See, right now, what's going to sustain you? If you had some triumphs, Back then, that has to sustain you. To, to trust even in this season like you trusted in those other seasons where it may not have been this big and it may not have accepted, uh, intercepted the whole world, but I, I'm sure that at some point in time um, something has rocked your world. So you know what it's like to have your rock, world rock. But you stood. But here's how Paul said it. Ephesians I'm mean, sorry, Philippians 3, verse 12. He says, not that I have already obtained it, this goal of being Christ-like, or have already been made perfect, but I actively press on so that I may take hold of that perfection, I'm going to call it maturity, for which Christ Jesus took hold of me and made me his own. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider that I have made it my own yet. And this is, you got, we have to learn to live in this space right here. What space is going fast? Made it my own yet, what do you mean? Live in a space where you are pressing towards, that you are actively moving forward, but you don't own this space. It doesn't, it still feels like a space you don't own. And having to live in the space that we don't own, we've had so much control. But what did this Hebrews chapter say? They are now controlled and sustained by their faith. Not by your strength, not by knowing what's going to happen. Not by knowing what are my children going to do. Um, you don't know. So you can choose to say it like worry. Would you cut half empty? Or you can say it with it half full. You can do that, and you can find half full speech instead of half empty speech. So are you saying that if I am on the receiving end of what you're saying, I can change my inner disposition or change my state of mind or spirit through acceptance of what is happening. I'm just trying to figure out what is the so what? The so what, if I can go back to remind you all that we were talking about, do not say, why were the old days better than these? Do not say, okay. that's speech. Um, then with the proper 18, a man's self, more self shall be filled with the fruit of his mouth, speech. So now, by the time we get up to uh, 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 Hebrews 11, he says, listen, if you are homesick for that country, if you're homesick for that country, guess what you're going to do? You're going to talk like a homesick person. You're, you're, you're going to talk like that, and what's going to happen? You're going to have an opportunity to go back to a past. You're going to have an opportunity to return to that space that was time, that, when it was time to leave. So that's the so what of this to say, I was at verse 13. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider that I have made it my own yet. Why is that made it my own yet? Why is it important to me as a leader like Paul to say to somebody, I'm not there yet? Because the whole goal of wishful thinking is to be able to predict. The thing, that, why, why, is a, why does anxiety overwhelm us and overcome us? Because we don't know. I had as a point person had to accept that 
I have not yet to obtain what I'm supposed to obtain in this season because it's just being shown to me. It's just being revealed to me. And I'm trying to read what you read. You, you said, I don't yet to think. What was the scripture you just read? No. I was reading verse 13. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider that I have made it my own yet, yeah. but one thing I do. And it's one right. One. And so I have not, for me to be vulnerable and to say I was depressed and to say that I was being tossed by this season was me only, all right, I ain't got this. Mm -hmm. And I can't pretend in front of people I taught, people I helped, people I disciple, that I am the strong one right now in this room. I had to be able to show at, at the best moments that I could, all right, this frailty I'm experiencing right now is a direct result of where I'm at. And I can't pretend like I got this. Mm -hmm. I don't. All right. And so what you have here, Ron, I triggered what you were saying, is that here, Paul is, 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 is making a declaration about his new space. And he's saying this, um, I'm still a work of progress. Mm -hmm. Listen, remember what he said was not that I already have, you tell me to read. not that I have already obtained it. Okay. What was it? This goal of being Christ like? So, so you so what does this help you not do? Put up walls, hide behind that wall. Some some people believe that because of of, of your goal to be Christ like and, and they've heard you talking that way for years, that you that you can't be saved. That you can't grieve and you can't mourn. You can't be, you can't uh, uh, have depressive feelings. And go through a season of low mood and motivation. Now, the season shouldn't last for so long because it will become you if you keep your mind stuck on that. But the bottom line is, even in your goal to become Christ like, when you get into that new space, you may not look the way you look. You may not look like that strong, dynamic leader because at that point, you are a student, you are an observer. And now I see why I brought this out. When you get into that new space, you gonna look like this. Ooh, and that is so. <laughs> you gonna look like this. You ain't gonna know what hit you. You're gonna go from where you were in control, in clarity, everything, clarity, and everything was okay. But then you're going you're gonna look like this to yourself because you're gonna realize I don't know what's going on. Mm -hmm. I don't know what's happening. And, but now you've got to still use that x-ray vision, meaning that spirit vision to say, God, help me peer into this. But let me not lose my mind or lose myself because I, I feel unglued and all over the place. Let me get out of this trance. Absolutely. And, and if you look at this in, in totality, uh, this is going to be first Philippians 3.12 through I think we're going to end up going to 16. You're going to see that that you when you come into the place where Paul is, he, he knows what he can't do, but he also knows what he can do. Mm -hmm. And so you have to know how to live in those two spaces. What what can I control? What can I what can I control? So let's talk about that. He said it this way. He says, not that I've already obtained it, the, this goal of being Christ-like or have already been made perfect. But I actively press on so that I may take hold of that perfection for which Christ Jesus took hold of me and made me his own. Verse 13, brothers and sisters, I do not consider that I have made it my own yet. But one thing I do, here it is right here. What's the one thing you can do? In this situation, what's the one thing you can do? This is what Paul knew about himself. He said, but the one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead, looking forward, not just looking forward, but reaching forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal. Do you have a goal? Is it your goal to become Christ-like? Is it your goal uh, uh, for the walls to come down? Is it your goal? You need goals. I, I talk about vision 
at least once a month. You got to set, you got to set something up to win. You got to plan to win. You need goals. So this is what he said. He said, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the heavenly prize of the upward call. He keeps his hand, he keeps his spiritual hand, his eyes, and his focus moving forward. You cannot reach and hold on at the same time. You cannot reach for the promise of God and not let go of the past mm -hmm. of what was taking place. Absolutely, that was good. And so he says, I press on toward the goal. So what is your goal? I know what your goal is. To win the heavenly prize of the upward call. Not just right here, upward call. He, he realizes I'm not there yet, but I do know I'm being called higher. This is the upward call. This has nothing to do with destruction of the things that need to live. And he says, of the upper call of God in Christ Jesus, verse 15, all of us who are mature, pursuing spiritual perfection, should have this attitude. It's an attitude. Mm -hmm. And if any, if, if, if in any respect you have a different attitude, that too God will make clear to you. Listen, he said, you don't understand, but listen to this. Only let us stay true. If you got a piece of paper, Jesus said, God, help me stay true to what I've already attained. Help me to stay true to, to what I know, to this half full. Help me to see the half full. Help me, help me to see that even though I'm in a, in a strange space, my cup is not empty. It's, half, it's filled already with some things that you've already done. I already have faith. Uh, 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 drips of faith, an opportunity of faith in here. It's not empty. It's strange. I don't, I don't know what else you want to pour in there. I don't know what's coming, but it's, I'm not empty. Why is that? Because this is your presence. You're here. This is not an empty space. And it's I'm, just a space that I don't recognize. And I'm not going to allow the craziness of thoughts, the voices, and all these things, I, even though I don't feel completely focused, I'm going to hold on to my faith, my trust in you, God. And although my vision may not be as clear as I want it, would like it to be right now, I'm still by faith going to hold on to you because eventually, if you trust that even here, if you trust that even here, he will bring clearer vision to you, but you've got to trust in this moment and know that there's going to be the day that will return and you will have a clearer vision, but you've got to make it through this, this trance of what you're in right now. Absolutely. And listen, and I'm getting ready to turn it over. You're going to have to, you're going to, have to know God in this space, not just in the building, not in your old space in this space, in this space. And what comes to mind to me was, you know, Abraham, when Abraham went to sacrifice Isaac. See, what we do is we'll say, um, Jehovah Jireh, my provider. No, 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 no. When uh, Abraham said that, it's because God provided. You got to allow God to provide in a new space. You got to know him in that new space. Then you can give him a, you, that's Abraham's name. That's I can't just use that name willy nilly. God, you say God, you're my provider because you provided, and I need it, and I called out, and Abraham said to his son, "The Lord will God will provide a land for himself." And guess what? Because of what he said out of his mouth, because of what he said to his son, because of the word spoken. Guess what was guess what was waiting up ahead that he didn't know about? There was a ram in a bush. But you don't get to see that with wishful thinking. We don't get to see that if we drop out because we don't know what's going on. But you do know the God that is going on. And that's where our conversation has to be. So I hope and pray as I turn this over that you take on this attitude that Paul had. To say, I may not be there yet. 
but I'm not going to talk like I don't know this God who has come through for me when I was in another situation. God bless you. Turn it over. Love you. So here's the final two things that I'll take as we go into prayer that I received from you both. One of the biggest things that was standing out to me the whole time you guys was talking is that this is the season to be completely sober-minded. Every time you guys said wishful thinking, all I could hear every time you say wishful thinking is that this is the season, Will. This is the season, everybody, to be sober-minded. What does it mean to be sober-minded? See, you're either drunk or you're sober. <laughs> when you're drunk, all you have is wistful thinking and other behavior that sometimes you're not even in control of yourself. You drink so that you can forget what you're actually supposed to be sober about. I hope that makes sense. But you drink to forget that I'm going through something. You drink to forget. See, and I'm not just talking about alcohol. See, right now we're drinking the world in so that we can forget about the world. And the world can't rebuke the world. Satan can't rebuke, cast out Satan. So the only way for me to move forward is going back to their last part is that my mind has to be focused on Christ. I have to know that being mature in my relationship with Christ has always, will always be my goal. And when I lose sight of that being my goal, then I start drinking again. And then when I start drinking the world in again, then I get caught up in wishful thinking and then forgetting that I had a goal in the first place. Why? Because I just want to forget, even if it's just for a moment, God, I don't want this pain right now. God, I don't feel like thinking about this right now. But if we remain sober-minded, even in the worst of circumstances, then I'll never lose sight that I've always had a goal in Christ. Maturity in Christ and my relationship with him has always and will always be that goal. Then I won't lose myself to all of what's going on around me. I hope that makes sense to you. Because it's, it's, it's right there. See, one of the disadvantages that I think um, we as a group of believers have is that we spent a lot of time in the church building behind walls um, misinterpreting that uh, blessings only feel good. Misinterpreting that blessings feel some kind of way. We put our own thing that if it don't feel like this, look like this, smell like that, feel like that, then it's not a blessing. Where if that's our mindset, we can forget that even in this season right here, it's all still a blessing. See, the blessing here is that we're now finding our ways back to God. We're now finding our path back to God. But see, if we can't look at this as a blessing, then we, we have wishful thinking for what was. And so with that, I pray earnestly right now. And I just, let's just bow our heads, close our eyes, wherever you are, under the sound of my voice, thankful for the word that was just sown into us and say, you know what? God, help me to know what my goal is. God, reveal to me, I humbly ask you in all sincerity, because I truly want to know, because somebody right now, God does not feel like they're going to make it through this season. And so, God, I'm praying earnestly right now that you reveal what their actual internal spiritual goal is. And, God, if you are not the goal, I pray that you become the goal for them right now. I pray right now, God, that you reinvigorate their spiritual life, their spiritual mindset, so that they can hear you, see you, and know that your presence is there right there with them. Father God, there is truly nothing too hard for you. So help us to see the blessing in this season. Help us to yearn and to chase after you. Help us to press forward in hearing your voice. Press forward in carrying out, even in this space, the work that you have for us to do right here, right now. God, I pray peace and silence over the voices of wishful thinking. We can wish all day, God. 
But Father God, help us just to be pulled into the reality of who you really are. Father God, my wish is to be closer to you. Help us all to make that a reality, God, so that we don't get lost, discouraged, destroyed, run amok in this season, God. A season that won't last always, but a season where we're supposed to learn more of you and be something different here. So that when we come out, God, whenever you should call that, call that time, we don't come out looking to recreate the party we were supposed to throw in the trash in this season. So Father God, I pray for a sober mind over everybody that's under the sound of my voice. I pray for a sober spirit over everybody that's under the sound of my voice. And may you and you alone be edified continuously and always. May our relationship be a beautiful thing. Always remain our goal. I thank you and I bless you for this opportunity and I give you glory and honor. May you be edified. Let the church say amen. 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 Amen.